Hello and welcome to another brand new chapter of uh, Mint's Paper Talk Parish series where we discuss and debate the key transformations that businesses in India are undergoing as they emerge from a very unprecedented crisis. And today uh, we discuss the heart of the Indian economy, as we know, the MSME sector. The sector, we all agree, there's a lot riding on it and its performance in the next foreseeable future will decide the course of the Indian economy in more ways than one. So please, uh, and also joining me in this show is my uh, co-host and my colleague Madhurima Nandi from Mint, and and our panelists today are Mr. Dr. Marshad Forbes, co-chairman of Forbes Marshall, Mr. Deepak Jain, President Automotive Component Manufacturers Manufacturers Association (ACMA), uh, Ms. Ardhika Shah, who is founder and CEO of Kinara Capital, uh, MSME, which is uh, MSME focused uh, NBFC, and Mr. Kamal Khan, Regional Vice President Salesforce India. And joining us will be Mr. T. S. Betty, Managing Director of the Bank of India. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us. It's a pleasure and a privilege, like always, to have uh, as an esteemed, uh, uh, speaker, uh, esteemed uh, speakers on the show. Uh, before we go to the broader questions of the economy, which includes liquidity crisis, the demand situation, you know, the supply situation, and so on and so forth, you know, the SME sector, which which it faces. Uh, but, uh, but but let me just first go to the first question, uh, the initial question, the China situation. I'll, I'll, I'll start with Mr. Forbes. A uh, lot of conjectures, a lot of apprehensions right now. Uh, there is, you know, there are simmering tensions in the border. How do you see this panning out? And if it actually takes a turn for, for the worse, how is it likely to impact the sector? So, you know, it's uh, one can understand the emotions involved. Uh, we we see this, I think, correctly as uh, uh, an act of great aggression, uh, as something that needs to be pushed back very forcefully on the military side. Um, but we should, I think, keep in mind that uh, uh, we need to win. We don't necessarily need to be right and be seen to be right all the time. So we should keep in mind what the numbers are. The numbers say that... Uh, China is our second largest trading partner. As our second largest trading partner, we export around $15 billion a year to China. Uh, we import from China around $75 billion a year. Most of these $75 billion of what we import are manufactured goods. And these are manufactured goods, very often consumer goods uh, that get consumed, bought by Indian consumers. So if you look at what's happening in these days, I mean, you know, today, yesterday, uh, we see delays taking place in consignments coming into the country. We see extra inspections. We see a move to shift, let's say, the traditional port that is used for goods that come in from China, Chennai, uh, shifting it to the West Coast. Um, we should keep in mind, what is, the, what is this going to achieve? It may make us feel good, but will it actually achieve anything substantive? And by delaying imports, uh, do we benefit ourselves uh, or do we just feel good about causing trouble in the broad area uh, of, uh, uh, of, of, a, of a country that we see um, correctly, I think, as uh, an aggressor? So I think keeping that in mind, instead of saying that, look, you know, how do we win? Uh, we should... I think, target our actions around that. And if we say, how do we win? Yes. Can we diversify our sourcing away from China? We should. Can we do it overnight? No, we can't. Can we do it over the next couple of years? We probably can. So how do we go about doing it over the next couple of years? Where the first that any Chinese manufacturer discovers that we're actually moving away from them is when they don't see orders. We don't need to announce it and be seen to be doing it so visibly. Uh, otherwise, that will, I think, only end up hurting us ourselves. No, I agree. That's a, that's a very valid point. Uh, uh, let me go to uh, Deepak. Deepak, um, Jain, so what do you, how do you see this uh, panning out? You know, there is obviously a question of national interest. You know, our our strategic goals for entire geopolitics, and then of course this immediate situation that a lot of small companies continue to face. If there's an overnight problem of you know imports uh, being stopped or you know being made difficult 
it puts a lot of smaller companies in a very very tight spot. Yeah, so I think I would completely agree with what Mr. Forbes said that I think we have to balance the emotions and the economy. And let's talk about the component manufacturers. Uh, we are a very integrated supply chain. Uh, we actually would have about four and a half billion imports coming in directly from China, which is accounting almost for one fourth of what we actually import out. Now, these are components where India does not have currently the manufacturing competence. And probably because of the scale, uh, we have gone to China for sourcing. And the component industry is so, I would say, theorized as well as integrated that once supplier stops, the whole actually um, industry would stop. And hence, I think there should be no knee-jerk reactions to China. Uh, I personally feel that we must continue a journey of Atma Nirbhar and self-reliance. Uh, the component industry, the auto industry has actually led the beacon of Make in India. 50% of the manufacturing GDP is actually done by the auto sector. So I think we must have some measured approaches. Uh, we must play to our strengths and see where we can balance it out. Uh, currently, we do not probably export that much as a sector to China. But we have to see that in a global front, China also is an extremely big market. Uh, so currently, I think we should not have any knee-jerk reactions and probably see how we can support sustainable supply chain and production lines. Let me just jump in here for a quick second. Um, so as, uh, as was mentioned, I run a NBFC last mile distribution um, that is focused on the MSME sector. Our average loan size is around three and a half, four lakhs. So most of our customers are under the sub one core segment. And 50, 60% of them are micro manufacturers. We did a customer sentiment survey during the lockdown to understand what is it that they are feeling. And a lot of the worry at that point was, when is the lockdown going to be over? What will my revenue stream look like? Will I have the orders to, to work on? But now, as lockdown is finished and with all the China stuff that's going on, the number one thing that when we are actually doing a resurvey, what we are finding on the ground is 70 to 75 percent of our customers or micro enterprises are actually concerned about the availability of raw materials and availability of product because a bulk of this does come from China. So we have we are essentially, you know, wearing shocks on top of shocks to the micro enterprises that as was mentioned, really are the engine of the economy today. Hadika, I have a quick question for you. Um, you know, you mentioned business sort of inching, uh, you know, towards normalcy despite the disruptions. Um, so, you know, obviously funding and, um, you know, fund infusion uh, into the sector remains a key issue. So, uh, you know, have NBFCs, have, uh, you know, fintech lenders, have you all started uh, sort of disbursements? Or are you all still waiting and watching? Uh, you know, given the given that MSMEs have been asking for emergency fund infusion. Yes. So uh, the answer to uh, to Inara Capital story is that we are not yet disbursing. We plan to start next month. Our original first during the lockdown, the large part of what we were trying to do is assess the ground realities and figure out our own cash flows. And there has been a huge amount of chaos and confusion and attempts to try to have liquidity measures put in place for mid-market NBFCs like Kinara Capital. However, we have, to be honest, fallen short of that at so many levels. So unless we have access to capital ourselves, it is very hard to support the micro enterprises to our, even our own customer base until so that, uh, that money flow starts happening. No, I'll, I'll just come in on that. So we, Mr. Sethi has joined us. So he's the MD of SBI, one of, you know, one of the MPs of SBI, uh, you know, SBI. He will be in a better position to answer about the whole money flow. Uh, we have to obviously go to the NBFC sector as well. But before we do that, I want to go quickly go to Kamal. Uh, so technology has never been so important, right? You know, right from credit appraisal to, you know, uh, to see, you know, where, uh, you know, the, your, what is the end use of funds and so on and so forth. How do you see yourself sort of uh, being, you know, playing the key enabler in the current situation? I think, uh, Kamal, I think you're yeah, on mute. I think I'm unmuted. <laughs> uh, thank you. 
am I audible now? Yes, yes, you are. Please go on. Uh, am I audible now? Oh, okay. Yes, fantastic. Okay. So for you know, I think technology is a journey for any organization, uh, which is which is clearly what organizations have to uh, look at uh, in terms of you know you, our current customers are going to be under a lot of uh, stress financially. I think uh, with the moratorium and all of that, that is there. Uh, there is an expectation that uh, you know uh, the payments probably not coming from our uh, respective uh, customers from an msme standpoint so that's that's definitely there so it's it's important for us to look at new channels uh, in terms of where we can source uh, you know newer customers because absolutely during disruption is where uh, you know we create new industries and we know that the pp industry has just become 10000 crores in uh, two months right there are industries like education as a sector has completely boomed on technology uh, at the front you know keeping uh, you know how we are delivering that tech uh, that's that's clearly there we are also seeing uh, a, a whole lot of other uh, industries doing really well so it's for uh, organizations to look at how they can uh, you know probably pivot themselves look at going there in fact one of our customers who is into making play equipment uh, was a play equipment manufacturer for uh, you know uh, for apartment complexes for hotels and so on they, they basically stopped operations for the time period and have completely pivoted towards making uh, you know ppe equipment with whatever raw material they have and they've really looked at that to raise capital and kind of keep uh, you know employees going and that required a lot of reskilling and uh, upskilling of their own employees so that's that's something um, i you know i'm hoping all uh, msmes would really look at uh, using this occasion Thank, thanks kamal let me let me go to mr forbes now uh, um, so we have a viewer question actually coming in so so do you want to know if for the government intention to support so before the villa tour package announcement for the msme sector uh, you know uh, of course, it's still unfolding, and uh, you know details are still awaited in certain segments. Uh, how much do you see that has actually impacted situation on the ground? I, I have some, you know, some some research which which you know there is on the on the on the on the current situation. Uh, so one particular you know market research says that sixty three percent of the enterprises have not approached a bank for any additional funding, and of the thirty seven percent that did, only less than a third managed to secure any funding. I I don't know if this is something that you are also noticing on the ground. I mean, you have a so, huge ecosystem under yourself. This is for this is for Mr. Sethi, or do you want me to answer that? Oh, it's for you, Mr. Forbes. Okay, so sure. So, uh, so you know, it's when the package was announced. Uh, the package was announced, as you know, uh, towards the end of May, and in a sense, the problem with the package for MSMEs was the delay in announcing it. Uh, we went into the lockdown uh, two months earlier. And in that period, a lot of MSMEs, I think, came under a great deal of stress and really had challenges in meeting obligations, meeting salary expenses, and so on. Uh, many of them came into the entire lockdown and the at the end of March uh, in a stress situation itself. And I think the MSME program that was announced, the loan guarantee program, was actually a very sensible program. It's the right way of going about doing things, which is to do it through guarantees. Two problems with it. One is the speed with which disbursements will happen. And second is the rate of interest that ends up getting charged. The rate of interest uh, has not been pegged. And even though interest rates have come down, that banks pay the RBI, uh, that transmission has not taken place to on to uh, small small industry, particularly large industry too, but especially small industry. And there's actually no good excuse for why that transmission hasn't happened, because these loans are now being provided. The incremental loans are being provided with a government guarantee. So if they're being provided with a government guarantee, then the risk premium should go away. So what is the basis then for having a spread of 5% and 6% uh, on interest rates, which end up being amongst the highest spreads in the world? So I think there's, a, there's an issue there. Uh, there's still a lot of caution on the part of banks 
in expanding lending to MSMEs. Um, it's starting to move. I think every week we're seeing more momentum build. Uh, but the challenge is really one of timing. You know, by the time it actually happens, uh, every week's delay ends up with more MSMEs actually getting into getting into trouble. And as they get into trouble, they do more and more things out of desperation. So I think addressing the timing issue and addressing the interest rate issue uh, is quite fundamental to what we need to do. If we really wish to see the MSME program that was announced have the benefits that was intended. So thank you, Amit Seti has joined us. Uh, Madhurima, before you go to your question, I'll, I'll, I'll quickly bring Mr. Seti in. Let him, I, I, if he has heard Mr. Forbes, uh, sir, your comments uh, on the whole uh, you know, differential between what RBI is charging you and what you are charging the customer. And that is perfect for all things. Yeah, hello, everyone. I think uh, you, are, you all can hear me out? Yes, yes, sir. We can hear you. Yes, and we can. Me too, I suppose. <clears throat> I think, uh, first, let me address what I think uh, Naushad was mentioning in terms of the transmissions. Uh, this is one area probably. Uh, there's a lot of uh, misconception in terms of what is the transmission which has happened and which was supposed to happen. I think fundamentally, structurally, you have to understand in Indian banks. I, and let me give first perspective on what SBI has done. For instance, there have been 13 rate reductions from January 2000, uh, starting from April 2019, when the repo rate cuts have happened. And uh, we have reduced the rates of interest in tandem with repo. We have two kinds of interested products. One is uh, repo linked loans, what we call external benchmark linked loans. And then you have what is so-called MCLR loans. We have passed on to the customers 100% of the repo rate reduction under the EB, what, uh, the external benchmark linked rate. And as far as the uh, MCLR rate cut is uh, concerned, two thirds uh, of the benefit which is given by the repo rate reduction has been passed on to uh, consumers. So that is at the micro level of SBI. If you look at the macro level, different banks have uh, done the different rate cuts. Essentially, how much they can uh, pass on and what is their ability is also largely determined by their asset liability composition. And uh, traditionally, banks in India have 90% of the liabilities coming from deposits, which you are all aware that the transmission of the interest rate is instant in case of loans, but in case of deposits, which are largely fixed deposits, cannot be repriced. So there is a lag. So this lag results in certain amount of, uh, you know, the delta between what report rate cuts happen and what is the rate of interest which is passed on. To. This is on the transmission front. And as far as the uh, one product which I think uh, you know, Shah was talking about, the guaranteed loan. Guaranteed loan, I fully agree with him. There is no capital because RBI has said that you know you don't have to maintain the capital. So absolutely, there is no capital cost on that. And the risk premium is virtually, you know, not should not be there because it's fully guaranteed. So, with that uh, two points which are available for the guaranteed emergency loan, which is rolled out under Atmanirbhar, let me tell you that we have committed to the government that this rate of interest from first July would not exceed seven point five by all the scheduled commercial banks. So, seven point five, I think, is a uh, is a good pricing, which uh, uh, which is significantly lower than what uh, today SMEs are getting from the market. Yes, there is a slight higher premium uh, if borrower is a NBFC uh, is borrowing from the NBFC for special reason that NBFCs also have a significant borrowing cost because their liabilities generally come from the borrowings. So, having said this, uh, I fully agree with the fact that. The credit is an important input for MSMEs and SMEs. And accessibility to the credit and affordability are the two important things which determine whether credit can actually help it. Either if it is too expensive or too difficult to get. I mean, it doesn't serve the purpose. I think uh, rightly pointed out uh, by Nash Nashaudan. 
so this particular guarantee credit uh, uh, you know enhanced uh, this emergency credit line which is rolled out addresses both these aspects in the sense that since it is guaranteed there's no reason for lenders to be risk averse number one because it is guaranteed and there's no capital charge it is affordable uh, pricing at 7.5 is given and as he also mentioned that there is a huge amount of involvement of all the lenders to make this product available to the msme borrowers today we have done in sbi alone around 3.5 lakh msme customers have been given this loan aggregating almost 17 to 18000 crores uh, sanctions have been given on the aggregate banking basis almost 75000 crores worth sanctions are already given that means you know the banks have understood the importance of timely availability of credit to msmes i think to that extent uh, it's a very good sign i'm not saying that everything uh, as far as the credit to sme and msme is hunky dory there are definitely structural issues in terms of affordable credit and accessible those are my preliminary remarks but there is a big third pocket here that we should discuss right which is that the very last mile distribution to the msmes today a big portion a huge portion of that is done by nbfcs so unless yes. that pass through happens through the nbfcs the msmes in the last mile will have a hard time accessing while sbi has done a fantastic job with such a large quantum it's a drop in the ocean to what is needed right now for the msmes to survive this crisis you want me to respond to us sorry you uh, you want me to respond to that no no absolutely please respond please okay so i i i, I think uh, I, i forgot i mean i was not there during introduction you are a hardy guy right i sure am sorry yes that's that's right i am hardika ah so uh, hardika i think uh, you rightly mentioned nbfcs in the last 3 years have become very very systemically important when i say nbfcs nbfcs mfis the whole gamut of you know the uh, last mile credit providers for two obvious reasons you know when uh, the large banks were going through their npa crisis and pain these are the people who had actually provided the capital to the needy people at the ground but we must also understand much of that capital was provided by the banks themselves right today the largest portfolio of any bank if you see the single largest portfolio would be on the nbfcs and mfis but ilfs crisis had dented the confidence where what people have had in the nbfcs we fully understand in sbi and i think the government also very clearly understood the importance of nbfcs and mfis to the Uh, last mile connectivity to this borrowers so a couple of uh, programs which they run in terms of partial credit guarantee uh, you your tier tro which is now defined that you know at least smaller mfis also should get as part of this tl tl tro whether all of them are getting whether they are getting right away i think it's uh, it, it, there is some time lag but there is absolutely uh, no confusion in the minds of the banks at least large banks like sbi and the government of india that these institutions nbfcs and mfis have to be protected sustained to see that the economy survives because they are they are very significant players so i, I don't think uh, there is any difference of opinion on that hardly just wanted to clarify things that's it come on a different note i wanted to ask you um you know the msme sector in india in general you know is characterized by low technology penetration uh, how does a company like salesforce uh, you know how do you all plan to address this uh, and also as a technology provider uh, you know what what are you ensuring or what did you ensure to sort of maintain you know business continuity uh, during the during the whole crisis period kamal then um so i think there is a i think there is some some technical issue uh, there uh, uh, we will get in kamal but before that let me just quickly go to deepak uh, um uh, you know so the situation uh, on the ground has it really changed in the last few few, few weeks uh, as the lockdown has eased demand continues to be a big concern for everybody uh, also for the banks you know on what basis do you do credit appraisal uh, are you seeing 
things change on the ground. Uh, uh, that's my first question. The second one is the entire cost competitive question, you know, aspect of things. Do you see MSMEs really becoming cost competitive without, you know, there are certain demands from the sector, you know, uh, for interest rate waivers, you know, subsidized electricity and so on and so forth. So without these things really being sort of added to, you know, uh, to help the sector, you see them becoming sort of, uh, you know, uh, reviving uh, in, the, in the way that everybody wants them to. So I think uh, in the component sector, I think currently there are three big challenges, cash, labor, and I think the third is the raw material. You know, these are the three major challenges we are grappling with uh, to have sustainable production runs. And of course, Amish says, you know, auto sector has been one of the worst sectors, probably in the top four sectors globally as well. Uh, you know, we can't fathom that, you know, you're getting out of a lockdown and the first thing you're going is to buy a vehicle. Uh, so definitely there are some green shoots we can see. And we can see the green shoots wherever the government has actually given, uh, let's say, a direct benefit transfer. So I'll talk about the agriculture space. And the agro, Amish say, the farmer has definitely got better input. And obviously, the COVID is not there so much in the rural areas. And he's going there and buying actually tractors. The tractor sales have been quite stable and robust. So I think these will be the challenges which we'll all have to face with, especially in the manufacturing, where we are looking at cash, labor, as well as availability of raw material. Uh, but I think going forward, what we really need to focus upon is actually demand creation. Um, you know, if I compare it globally, you know, um, people, the governments have stepped in to actually enhance consumerism, give the confidence to get demand generation. We can talk as much as we want on MSMEs, um, you know, but MSMEs will always be talking, we're running against time. It's going to be three months, six months, but if demand doesn't kick in, you know, if we actually don't uh, incentivize demand, uh, then I think we are actually going to grapple with this problem and a much more severe problem. Kamal, on a different note, I have a quick question for you. Um, you know, the MSME sector in India, in general, uh, you know, has always been characterized by sort of low technology penetration. So, um, and you know, how can technology be a game changer? And as a company, uh, Salesforce, how do you all plan to address this in terms of, you know, tech upgradation or R&D and, and other fronts? So uh, if I have to give you a few numbers, right? We, we, we all know that there are 75 million SM, MSMEs in this country, of which we're talking about 12 to 16 million literally having some kind of an online presence, which is on social media, which is on Facebook or uh, of some sort. Five lakh domains have been, you know, uh, web domains have been registered in this country, but 50% of them are not even, you know, active, which means We've got only about two, two lakh, uh, two million, uh, you know, MSMEs who have a website today. So that's that's precisely tech penetration that we are having. And clearly, what we are seeing, at least in the last four uh, four months, as an organization, is there is definitely a lot of, uh, you know, anxiety. One, yes, there's a lot of support, but also, uh, you know, MSMEs realizing that there is a need for tech. Now, is tech something, it, it, it's definitely not, uh, you know, about uh, apps or social media or anything. It's about, you know, goals and it's about, you know, processes and sense what they really want to do. And it's a journey. Now, in this journey, what Salesforce really helps is finding new channels, finding new customers, you know, so basically helping you find new customers at the same time, helping your customers win in terms of being more compassionate with your customers in terms of taking that journey, who are going through that pain, being able to connect rather than you know really sell to them. And uh, finally keep them to give you a complete 360 of uh, whoever our customers are, how much ever small they are. And all of this running it from your phone, right? Uh, you, you basically can run all of this from your phone, making it as simple as possible for an SME to use it because you can't give them you know something that's rocket science you need to democratize it give them that tech and that tech tech could be you know cloud computing or that tech could be artificial intelligence but giving it right in their hand making it very simple for them to get started and use it so that's that's really what Salesforce has been leading and uh, we really uh, look at uh, helping SMEs like that and that's that's clearly what I think we would come out of this in that way. 
Right. No, I will now go to a viewer question. Uh, this uh, this question is for everybody. Feel free to answer. The viewer wants to understand if there is a disconnect between a branch level official and uh, and an MD of of a large bank like SBI. I will start with Mr. Petty and I'll go to others. You know, is there a problem? So uh, <clears throat> there is definitely a problem. I think uh, it it would be uh, inappropriate on my part to say that uh, there is. Uh, no problem at the branch level or operating level. There is absolutely an issue. Over a period of time, what happened when the SME and SM MSMEs have started having lot of sick units in the last four five years? It is not only COVID. I think even pre COVID also they had their own challenges. So there has been lot of issues at the operating level whether they should actually finance them or not. Number one. Number two. I think over a period of time, many of the banks started focusing on the uh, so-called retail loans, housing loans, car loans, uh, consumer loans, which are fairly easy to handle, right? It is most of them are digitized products, end-to-end -end solutions. So, whereas uh, lending to an SME or MSME requires a lot of engagement, a lot of involvement, a lot of hand-holding. I think uh, bank branches found it difficult. Uh, a lot of us, you know, the senior officials who have started our career uh, funding the MSMEs, that the same thing was not available in the current generation of officers and the uh, you know uh, operating people who are at the branch levels. So this is what we call the, there has been a disconnect between the operating people and the small and medium scale industries, which actually look for a lot of hand holding from the bankers. So this has resulted in even a simplest MSME product not being delivered in time. Even if you have a loan against property or in a simple overdraft, uh, you know there are a lot of horror stories that people have to go for 30 days, 45 days around the bank. And some of that gap has been filled by the efficient NBFCs and MFIs. Today, why uh, 30 to 35 percent market share of NBFCs and MFIs in this space is essentially because I think uh, most of the customers were not uh, taken care of by the banks. So today, what uh, whatever you do, I think uh, the disconnect cannot be completely removed. But we need to put an efficient system in place. But uh, today, what every bank, at least public sector banks, are told to look at, how do we enable the customer to originate his request online, digitally? Like you must all be knowing that PSB 59 portal is a portal which is available to any lend, uh, borrower. And there's a strict timelines where it is monitored at the uh, highest level in the Ministry of MSMEs and uh, Financial Services. Why this application is pending for 30 days in uh, PSB 59 portals? This is on the systemic level. At the bank like SBI, which is a very significant presence in MSC and SME, the, we felt the need for totally revamping the delivery system. How do I make one of the important officials sitting in my zonal office across India? Today, the, uh, you know, in this month of June, we put 80 of assistant general manager level officers across India, 80 centers, who will be the single point of contact for SMEs and MSMEs. I think this is what is missing. Uh, uh, the MSMEs and SMEs can put up with slight delay, can put up with a slightly additional cost, but what they are interested in, somebody guiding them, what are the products available, how quickly they can get this product, what is the most suitable product for them. I think this is what I think banks have definitely have to look at it. I fully appreciate the fact that there is a great amount of disconnect at the operating level, which we all are working to remove them. It cannot be simply removed by posting more and more number of people, but we have to look at the efficiency in the processes. Today, today, as part of, I don't know how many of you are know, aware, there is what is called enhanced access and uh, you know service excellence, which is a program which the government of India started, is is program. Each of us is uh, measured on what how efficient our products in reaching the customers. And ease 3.0 expects that most of the MSMEs should be able to access the credit, what is called credit at click. The MSME clicks the uh, computer uh, in his office and he can choose the bank where the loan is required. And from there, it will be monitored by the government of India that how this loan is going to be closed by the banks. 
so this is what is required now whatever you say in terms of deploying more people is not going to help i think uh, the new processes and new sensitivities towards this sme customers is what uh, in my view is the need of the no couldn't agree more i mean uh, the first step towards solving a problem is realization and uh, one of our viewers is actually saying that he is saying that the sbi sbi md has been quite honest in his observations about what needs to be done on that note let me go to mr hopes uh, your comments sir uh, i mean uh, you, do you see the same issues you know in within your ecosystem and deepa can probably answer after mr hopes i think sir you are on mute i i think i think mr shetty has answered the question very well so uh, uh you know and he i think has answered both what the issue is and how it's uh, being addressed i'll add only one thing to that which is that very often uh, when one has an initiative that one is trying to transmit from uh, top management to an operational level uh, one sends mixed messages maybe not on the particular initiative but in terms of the overall performance metrics that one has in place so if for example one has an initiative to say look disperse these msme loans where we have guarantees in place where uh, we we have access to low cost funds uh, disperse them quickly right but at the same time we have a lot of review mechanisms to ensure that we do not end up with non performing loans in place there's a lot of discussion and accountability for having a very solid and good loan portfolio uh, these tend to sort of fight against each other and the operational uh, the operational manager uh, thinks well okay what i'm asked every month or every week is this set of questions and i need to answer to them there's now this particular initiative which is running somewhat contrary to what i'm asked every week so you need to sort those things out uh, at the end of the day to really bring about alignment between what the top management has decided and what the operational level finally has to implement and deliver deepak your view let me give you a very different side of view i mean so let me talk about if i am an msm right and i see these grand announcements uh, and we say okay fine i'm going to go to the bank and i'm going to get my loan and all my problems are going to get resolved but this is actually not the case right and he knows that he's not going to get it he's probably going to have and for whatever reasons and i would say very honest reasons were necessary and mr forbes elaborated on so i think what will the msme do either he will basically find some other ways and other measures to see and keep his business afloat he can do it for a few weeks few months or he would actually close shop and i think this will come into a classic kind of this twin balance sheet problem that if msmes actually go down i mean say bank will also have more npas on the back and i think this is where the struggle is and i think the only solution is what mr sethi alluded to is actually have a digitized or a ease of doing business on actually dispersing loan with a flexibility and agility uh, towards the msme and if msme gets the confidence and the assurance that there is some way he is able to do it and i think there has to be a lot of education given to especially the micro and the small enterprises i think then we can definitely have a much more stable outcome of this financial crisis can can i come in for a moment actually i think uh, uh, not to underplay the importance of financing in any of the industrial activity there are a host of other issues to be addressed in msme space i think we are all aware for example what is happening on the receivables why do they not get in 6 months 8 months 12 months so these these are uh, one issue of you know the receivables number one number two what what is the ecosystem industrial associations uh, you know so many other bodies doing in terms of ensuring that this msme smes and msmes are not becoming technologically obsolescent see these these are all things which are not finance related while the finance and the credit affordable accessible credit is most important part but that is not the only one which is playing the uh, smes and msmes i think we must be mindful of that the more and more we talk about uh, the credit availability 
I think in a way, uh, we, uh, we tend to ignore the other larger issues in terms of access to market. I think uh, somebody definitely talked uh, the market access, you know, e-commerce and all. Uh, the, the, the payment of receivables in time, how do you enforce the discipline among the corporates, government agencies who are buying? Uh, like, for example, TREDS initiative. They, I hardly find any corporates using the TREDS platform at all. It's a wonderful platform. Why are they not pushing the corporates mandatorily? You have to put the, uh, your, uh, you know, you buy, uh, you put the receivables in the TREDS platform. I think there are issues other than credit too, which we should not ignore. I think any discussion on SMEs and MSMEs should definitely be talking about those issues also. While, of course, the topic of the today is probably on the limited aspect of credit, but I think I would like to make a point that uh, all of us have a responsibility to guide them. Like, for example, we will be soon coming out with an initiative. How do I make consultancy part of my credit disposition? I, I we will engage something, uh, somebody to provide that consultancy services at free of cost to all my MSMEs who are banking with SBI. Why can't we do that? But the, the moment he realizes that it is bundled with the credit and he is not going to pay anything extra. But I am trying to tell him that there is a resource available to you in terms of improving your processes and how do you improve your market access? How do you protect? Uh, your uh, you know safety aspects i think these are all the things which every one of us in the ecosystem have to provide it is not only simple giving up credit that's my view. yeah if i if i can just come in on what uh, mr seti said you know i think he made a very pertinent point right when we come out of this it is about the consulting so i think msmes definitely need not you know the big boys can definitely get whomever they want right they can get the big names to come and talk about strategy about consulting about how to do it but for an msme who's going to do it it's 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 part of us uh, you know each of us who are probably helping you know it could be kinara it is sbi and it's acma you know we, we probably have to provide them that help and that uh, support in terms of where they need to come out with what is the process that they need to put in place you know where do they really look at and if i have to tie in that point on china that we spoke early you know, for all the manufacturing that China does is, uh, you know, low level manufacturing, right? Uh, what is the total, um, you know, amount that they probably get in terms of uh, revenue that they generate for all the manufacturing that they do? Let's take an organization, a country like Japan, you know, they do very little uh, manufacturing, but for the IP that they've created, the value that they create, so it's a value versus a volume uh, game. And I think clearly for India, and our SMEs that are there is to look at where do they want to play. You know, uh, is it clearly in the value space uh, or, you know, something like innovation that we invest in, really look at uh, Industry 4.0, how do we get, uh, you know, to the next level of uh, generating that IP so that the world looks at us, we are able to uh, get a larger buck or we look at, you know, increasing low level manufacturing, we continue to do what we are doing and how are we going to embrace technology so uh, and for that we all are, as actors have to play you know technology organizations financial institutions you know associations like deepak uh, you know that he leads obviously he does lead a very uh, uh, great organization as well but also as as that uh, charter of acma i think what they would probably be doing and uh, you know uh, uh, that's that's clearly something that i think we have a, a responsibility to deliver Kabul, I wanted to quickly, uh, you know, uh, uh, sort of make a point from what you said. I mean, that's a really valid point because, uh, you know, during this whole crisis, uh, you know, automation, uh, particularly in the supply chain area and digitization has been constantly talked about. I wanted to ask you that, you know, it's often said that, you know, cloud is going to play uh, like a really important role and will be a, a key solution for MSMEs you know, whether to cut costs or increase productivity. Um, is there anything that you could talk about in terms of custom offerings, uh, you know, that are tailored uh, for this kind of a crisis uh, for the MSME sector? So the first thing, uh, you know, was from a technology standpoint, we all want to keep our businesses, you know, running, right? And I think as SMEs, they all wanted to keep, uh, you know, businesses running. Uh, and we, when we probably ran it, out of you know if, if i have to talk uh, as an as an sme my brother runs one 
so if we probably you know ran it uh, through a um, uh, you know through our khatas or uh, the desktops at home and when something like this absolutely untoward happened you know we really did not know how to uh, how to you know operate so i think clearly that way you know dependency on systems taking it out and doing it on something that we can really do so i believe for smes the the leaders in that organization the proprietors or uh, the, the home offices that they really have have to run it from their you know mobile it's it's up doing business from anywhere any device and that's clearly what salesforce helps in terms of running your business from anywhere or any device does does not uh, really matter the second is how are we looking for the future right future is about how are we going to acquire new customers there are a lot of unknown how how are we going to look at audience management in terms of which is the population set i have to go to looking at your unknown customers and you know getting them to know so that i really cater to them so that's something that if we can nurture that customer who's out there and then bring them uh, into a band where we can probably you know uh, work with them more intelligently the customers that we already have how do we uh, you know kind of service them better i think that's going to be very key next is looking at our own suppliers right every 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 uh, organization does have suppliers looking at our suppliers and how we can give them better visibility connect with them all of that is happening and the most important point is employees right we i don't think we can probably come back uh, to the same way that uh, we were uh, for five months back so that is going to involve a lot of motivation you know monitoring how we do do you know the shift management the whole command center around that and taking care of employee well being is going to be key and how we going to attain that and deliver that is something that salesforce really is uh, you know concentrated on and helping our customers and how smes can come out of this and definitely yes we do have programs and we do have uh, uh you know uh, the, the commercial aspect of it to help them in terms of uh, uh you know all that requires for them to come up sure thanks uh, uh, kamal uh, hardika uh, wanted to you know uh, no please Go continue ahead. i just wanted to add one thing to what kamal was saying that i thought was very uh, important uh, from from what we see with our msmes right one it absolutely is critical that there needs to be technology to that that is relevant to them uh, the piece that we often forget is it needs to be technology that's also vernacular because vernacular becomes an important element for how the msme operates so as far as we can make our tech uh, language ready as well then that is a that is going to be you know a long way to getting the adoption done though, as well but that's that's it all i was adding go ahead ask the question uh hadika going back to the uh, you know to the to the to the financial aspect of it uh, you know wanted to ask you uh, uh, you know you did say that uh, you know disbursement will only start uh, from your end uh, the next month but uh, you know on a broader note uh, will access to easy and sort of cost effective finance you know play a critical role in the revival of msmes i mean we all know that there will be pain over the next few quarters but uh, you know how important will cost effective finance be in the revival Uh, it will be critical we talked a lot about how we need to do demand generation or if we have but if demand is generated capital is required to actually build it out and so msmes are going to need uh, access to capital more so than ever and as this world is collapsing around us if we get more and more stringent about how we select the uh, the msmes that get it and don't get it we we are probably going to create even further broken supply chains so this part is critical and i you know i'd like to mr sethi was talking about how the nbfcs have to form an important part of this so access to capital to us to to msmes is, is going to be equally critical for the ecosystem to survive the next 9 10 12 months or as long as this is going to take sure devashi do you want to take the next one Yes, uh, yes, of course. Um, I, I wanted to go to Mr. Sethi first, and then go to Mr. Pope and uh, and, and Deepak. The big question everybody is asking: How are we bracing for the post moratorium world? Uh, you know, I mean, we have this whole responsibility of revival at the same time. How are we bracing for what's going to happen once this the moratorium ends, and how are we going to sort of find our way through that? See, I think I 
wish to, I don't know, I mean, it may not be a great analogy, but I wish to state that moratorium is like lockdown in the sense that what was the purpose of the lockdown? That you get prepared yourself for anything which is going to happen, right? So the moratorium had given a breathing space to many people. In fact, uh, this is, uh, uh, you know, uh, the conservation of uh, cash. While it comes to the fact that many people might not have availed the moratorium uh, because they had the cash flows, but those people who were in need of conserving the cash, they have availed the moratorium. Uh, they have deferred their installment payment. So uh, it, it is not uh, apocalypse which is likely to happen post moratorium. I think we must all understand that. Because uh, in many of the banks, even in NBFCs, barring you know, MFIs because their targeted group is different, much of uh, the portfolio withstood the pressure. But the post moratorium, it all depends on how quickly the normalization happens. We all, uh, you know, it's, it's not a rocket science to state on that. So my view is that we need to understand there will be two, three different categories of borrowers. The borrowers who have uh, ability to come back to normalcy because they have additional uh, breathing space, which they availed by way of moratorium. Number two is that uh, they have the ability to ramp up their production immediately. I think they, they may not really face any problem. They may have uh, issues of cash flow, but they can sustain. The second category are the people probably, I, I'm talking about MSME and SME. I'm not talking about the retail segment. It's a different ballgame altogether. In MSME, SME, uh, this is the first category who can sustain because they have had this six months moratorium and the ability to come back is intact with them. The second category would be the customer, uh, the MSMEs who have, uh, they probably require some kind of rephasement of their loans. Uh, fortunately for MSMEs, uh, we can restructure them under the RBI dispensation up to March 21. My view is that some of these MSMEs which are going to have some issues in terms of their prolonged cash flow issues can be addressed under the restructuring. The third category of the people are the ones which had issues pre-COVID and their issues got complicated because of the COVID. These are the ones which require a different dispensation, which are hopefully, you know, this subordinated debt, which is coming, uh, the government is floating a fund, 20,000 crores, which we would like to utilize that fund to support them by way of additional financing. And they will bring the margin money from this fund. This is the third category, which is the most vulnerable category in my view. So these three categories have to be, first of all, I think there should not be any knee jerk reaction on the part of the lenders that this guy is becoming NPA, let me pull the plug out. I think that's one important uh, thing which lenders should realize that if they do anything like that, uh, what I think Hardika was saying or somebody was mentioning that if you don't handhold them, they're likely to default and you will never get the money back. And the loss given default in this industry is very high, right? So it is in our interest, lenders' interest, to handhold them as long as possible and as much as possible. But one thing I would definitely tell the MSMEs not to indulge in is to overcome this cash flow mismatches and losses which they've incurred. They should not fund by way of raising new loans. It's a death knell for them. They are going to get into debt trap. So it is better for them to come back to the lenders that I have some part of my debt which I cannot pay. You please give me some uh, relief on this. Either you, uh, you know, take a haircut and give me a restructuring, or you rephase my loans. Or I think this conversation should happen. And we are actually uh, 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 emphasizing in our people that each relationship manager in his portfolio has to categorize his borrowers into A, B, C. What I mentioned just now, and the C category, they cannot simply tell them that you know, you are either you pay or your account is NPA. They have to find a solution to that. We still have the challenge of how do I articulate this management view till the last mile. We are working very hard. I think, uh, again, this moratorium had helped us to strategize on this. How do I reach out to my operating people and MSMEs to tell them that these are the three categories of people which you have to have different solutions. And today, we have had huge amount of outreach programs. I myself, I'm talking to the MSMEs. I think I must have addressed almost 20 webinars where MSME customers were present. 
and i keep telling them three these three mantras don't borrow more to get into you will get into larger problems and if you have a problem please start a dialogue with the banker and if you can address your issues by availing the moratorium please avail the moratorium we are now never saying that please don't avail the moratorium but if you have the ability please pay because it is an additional cost to you i think broadly this is my view on how do we address the post moratorium issues but uh, as i think you rightly pointed out the critical piece in the whole scheme of things is how quickly consumption gets revived how quickly demand gets uh, you know back in uh, track if it doesn't happen i will just give you a data point despite start uh, sanctioning 18000 crores worth loans people have not drawn full amount and even if they have drawn they have just put in their cash credit account because they are not sure how it is going to play out they are all waiting it out whether whether they need that money in fact large number of people said that you know you please give me sanction but i don't take the money is it okay is it fine perfectly all right so that means everybody is there is a great amount of uncertainty hopefully post august and july and august will help us to understand how it is going to play out and uh, but i can assure you that i think most of the banks have been sensitized by the government and we ourselves believe that if you don't support them the loss is more to the banks than the you know the system so the support so you know the if you take the if you take the moratoriums the moratoriums were to meet a temporary and immediate cash crunch um that's the sole purpose that they are meant to actually achieve and we shouldn't see the moratorium as uh, in any way helping with any underlying solvency issues of any kind of enterprise because it doesn't help with solvency issues it helps with immediate liquidity issues and that too very short term liquidity issues having said that remember that the moratorium also means that one the the company will the msme will end up paying interest on the interest so the interest that has been postponed as a result of the moratorium will has ends up getting added to the loan which ends up then needing to be financed in turn so again it's it's not a you know it's not like the moratorium is this huge benefit that has been provided uh, to uh, either consumers uh, or msmes it's only meant to provide that short immediate liquidity assistance the second point uh, i fully agree with the point on demand uh demand is indeed critical what can we do actually to stimulate demand uh yes sentiment will drive a lot but the most direct thing that the government can do to stimulate demand is to pay its bills the government owes probably somewhere on the order of 3 lakh crores to large companies state governments and msmes if one paid those bills if one paid that 3 lakhs crores off that's a huge liquidity infusion into the economy which can go a very long way to enhancing liquidity across the spectrum large companies small companies the entire enterprise sector and it can go a very long way also to then saying okay let's things are getting back to normal i have actually great confidence that things can improve fairly quickly and that sentiment can start turning up uh, fairly quickly that's what we're seeing happen with rural demand today if you look at the if you look at what's happened with for example unemployment unemployment went between middle of march and middle of april unemployment rose by a massive amount by about 120 million people right we went from about 7% unemployment to 26% unemployment between the middle of april and the middle of may unemployment dropped from 26% down to about 21 22% and if you look at what's happened between the middle of may and now the third week of june unemployment has fallen back to about 8 9% it's still it's still higher than it was in the middle of march but we've seen this huge responsiveness we've seen this huge increase in unemployment and then we've seen these jobs coming back in a very significant way particularly in rural areas particularly as a result of the narega program so a variety of different things that are actually getting people people in rural areas having money in their hands 
and that means they will go out and spend. If you talk to consumer goods companies, what they're saying is that today demand in rural areas and in semi-urban areas is either back to last year's levels or at about 90% of last year's levels. Where we're still struggling is in the big metros, in Bombay, in Delhi, in Ahmedabad, in Pune, in Chennai, all the metros which are all still suffering with lockdowns and the spread of the virus and an increase in cases. As that, as that gradually improves in the next couple of months, I think we'll see demand come back in the larger cities as well. The last comment has to do with uh, the, nature of, uh, the nature of business. You know, we should see, we should see bankruptcies as a part of the business cycle. We don't like to see that in the country. You know, only in India do you have this phenomenon of sick companies. No other, no other economy in the world has a sick company. You either have companies that are alive or you have companies that are not. You don't have this in-between stage. And I think we need to get over this idea that all companies having once been formed will continue forever. Right? Some companies will succeed and grow and thrive and prosper. And other companies will fail. And if they fail, one should cut one's losses, whether it's as a bank or another creditor, clear out that company and let it be replaced by a company that is going to be more successful. That might sound brutal, but it's actually the way in which one ends up with a competitive, dynamic economy. Look, fair point. Uh, let's go to Deepak. How does ACMA see this? Uh, my first, first, first question is the demand situation, and do you see some companies obviously dying out out of this whole crisis? And uh, yeah, yeah. So let me say. I mean, so let's go back a decade. I mean, say as far as the component industry, the auto sector, the economy. 2008, what happened? 2014, what happened? Every crisis had made us more resilient. We have emerged much more stronger than what we were in 2008. Of course, this pandemic is of a different nature. But you know, whenever we talk about different types of recovery, U, W, V, always we actually talk about the suffix as recovery. So at least ACMA is optimistic that there is going to be recovery. What also it has done today in terms of just this whole monitorium, this lockdown, is that we've actually been able to get into our own financial due diligence. You know, you have to understand we are an extremely tierized and interdependent supply chain. So what is done is that our starting from our customers, the OEMs, to tier ones, to tier twos, you've actually gone and handheld people on finances, on quality, on even productivity. And I think our current essence would be that how do we basically ensure that in muted demand also, we keep on running our shop floors, although we are going to have cost appreciation, but make it more efficient. So I think that's what the current challenge is. But at least we are seeing that there is going to be demand revival. As Mr. Forbes said, the rural already we are seeing in the farm sector, we're already seeing this. And hopefully within the next 60 to 90 days, we should basically come back to certain sustainable levels. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for, for, for that you know, outlook. Um, uh, you know, uh, this discussion can go on forever. You know, I'm enjoying every part, every bit of it. But my producer is telling me we are already out of time. So thank you, everybody, for joining us. Look forward to having all of you again very soon, maybe after after the moratorium period has ended. Thank you very much once again. From, uh, thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.